Welcome. My name is George Mann, and I'm the writer of New Green Hobbs, Witchwood, and Star Wars The High Republic. This is Kevin Shinnick, writer of Star Wars Force Collector. I'm Kevin Scott, one of the story architects of Star Wars The High Republic. This is Dominic Pace, who plays Gekko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian. Hi, I'm Claudia Gray. I write Star Wars books. And you're listening. And you are listening. And you are listening. To Star Wars Comics in Canon, the Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 141. So my friends, this week I am tackling the five Clone Wars Battle Tales comics published by IDW Publishing back in 2020. This serves as a really, really good companion for the Clone Wars series because actually there's a lot of connections to the Clone Wars and obviously as this was released after the Clone Wars, it's got a lot of tie-ins which make a lot of sense in the story without negatively affecting the canon or retconning anything or anything like that. So this is actually really just a fun Clone Wars arc almost, just in comic form. So uh, I did enjoy it, and you get a lot more information on some of the clones and some of their thoughts in this. So I was somewhat sceptical going into this. I did obviously purchase it, and I wanted to talk about it. But because it's an all-ages comic from IDW Publishing, I wasn't really sure how good it was going to be. But before I delve into all of those things, if you haven't joined me before, what I do here is go through these comics in chronological order, giving you the plot details of each comic as I go through it, and then along the way I give you bonus information on certain things. And on this episode in particular, because it's all around the Clone Wars and clones specifically, I'm going to give you a lot of information that is Clone Wars adjacent, but I will not be spoiling the Clone Wars, bar one very minor character's death, but I'll get into that when we get there. So if you haven't picked up these Star Wars comics before, that's completely fine. You don't need to have read these comics to enjoy this episode. In fact, you don't need to have read a single Star Wars comic, read any Star Wars literature, or even seen the Clone Wars series or movie. I would just recommend you've seen the main air quote Star Wars movies. But realistically, as long as you loosely know who Obi-Wan and Anakin are, then you'll be fine. But before delving into the plot of these comics, let's give you some information surrounding it, including when it was released and the people involved in creating these. So these comics, much like other all-ages comics, have got a framing story and then individual stories within it. So there are technically six stories going on. There's the one framing story, and then per each of the five issues, there is then a slightly smaller story. So the writer for all of these is Michael Moresi. The artist for the framing story is Derek Charm, and the colour artist for the framing story is Louis Antonio Delgado. I'll delve into the respective artists for each of the issues when we get there, but just to note, issue number one was released May 20th, 2020, issue number five was released September 30th, 2020, and the trade paperback collection was released January 26th, 2021. And these comics were released by IDW Publishing, so they are still canon, but you won't find them in a lot of the usual places, such as Marvel Unlimited. Now, timeline-wise, this is set within the Clone Wars. So the Clone Wars starts right at the end of Attack of the Clones and finishes partway through Revenge of the Sith. So Attack of the Clones is 22 years before the Battle of Yavin, and Revenge of the Sith is 19 years before the Battle of Yavin. So the Clone Wars takes place over three to four years there, thereabouts. After Attack of the Clones, you've got Queen's Hope, a book by E.K. Johnston, part of the Queen's trilogy. Then you've got Brotherhood by Mike Chen, which I did actually do a book review on this very channel, so make sure you check that out. And then after that, you've got these Clone Wars battle tales. And I think there's like one or two very small stories. I believe the Anakin story from the Age of Republic special. That is also set before the Clone Wars movie. And then you've got two Clone Wars episodes, which I think are in series two. I think one of them is called Cat and Mouse, which are chronologically set before the Clone Wars movie. Then you've got the Clone Wars movie. Then you've got the rest of the Clone Wars series. So in a very standard Star Wars fashion, things are a little bit all over the place. But all you need to know is Attack of the Clones, Queen's Hope, Brotherhood, these issues, and then all the other Clone Wars content. So because this is before the Clone Wars movie, Ahsoka is not in this. This is before Anakin got his Padawan. But I think that gives you enough background information, so let's just delve straight into issue number one. So issue one's artists are Ariana Florzan and Mario Del Pinino. The colour artist is Valentina Taddeo. Now, there are no crawls or briefs before any of these issues, at least in the trade paperback collection, which I have, so I'm just going to delve straight into the story. So issue one starts off, this is the framing story, with a bunch of clones fighting on the planet of Hessene, which the planet itself hasn't been mentioned elsewhere in the canon as far as I can see, and they are fighting against droids, which obviously they call clankers. 
They're fighting against the standard B1 battle droids, which are the kind of the long nosed ones you see in Phantom Menace, and then some super battle droids come out, which are the B2 battle droids. They're the ones that the heads are almost non existent, it just looks like shoulders and a body, and they've got like the triple blasters on their arms and rockets and things like that. They're like the big hulking grey ones. The things are looking a little bit bad for these clones, and then three Jedi show up. Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Plo Koon, and they're there to stop Count Dooku from dissolving the members of Parliament from that planet, which would then make the whole planet fall to the Confederacy of Independent Systems, aka the Separatists, so the Republic feel like this must be stopped. Commander Cody notes that Anakin is a bit of a loose cannon, and Rex says that he may be that, but he always goes back for his men. And then we get a flashback. So there's a few things to unpack there. First of all, the clones that are in this story, in the framing story. So arguably the most famous one is Commander Cody, and that's because you see him in live action, specifically Revenge of the Sith. He's actually one of the ones that after Order 66 orders to fire upon Obi-Wan on the planet of Utapau. Commander Cody's call sign is CC2224, and he is part of the 212th Attack Battalion, which is the main battalion that Obi-Wan throughout the Clone Wars has assigned to him. Then also with him, you've got CC3636, who is Wolf. He's part of the 104th Battalion, which is usually assigned to Plo Koon. Now, Wolf is in around 10 episodes of The Clone Wars, and he's also featured in Star Wars Rebels. So he's one of the three clones that they find in, I think, Season 2. You've got Rex, you've got Wolf, and you've got Gregor. And to clarify, some of these clones have appeared in little bits and pieces of other content, but I'm just trying to kind of skim through their Clone Wars appearances. Also with them, they have CT4860, who's called Boost. He's actually in four episodes of The Clone Wars, a couple from Series 1 and then one from Series 3 and Series 5. And then you've got Rex, who is CT7567. He is part of the 501st Legion. He is most people's favourite clone trooper because he is incredible. He debuted in The Clone Wars movie. He is in a huge amount of Clone Wars episodes, probably more than any other clone. And he is also in Star Wars Rebels. He did also appear very briefly in the Ahsoka series and he was also in the Bad Batch as well. Now there will be more clones to go through as we get there, but those were the main ones that we see in this framing story. Now Plo Koon. Now Plo Koon is a Jedi that I found out that a lot of people who don't consume a lot of deeper Star Wars content seem to know. I think he's kind of like a fan favourite just because he looks so different. So he is in the prequel trilogy, he does get killed in Order 66 in the montage, he's flying a ship and then Order 66 happens and two of the clones behind him shoot him down. He is a species of Keldor, they are from Dorin. Now he's actually the Jedi that found Ahsoka Tano. I believe you see that in one of the Tales of the Jedi episodes, or it might be in the Clone Wars. You see like a flashback when Ahsoka gets found. But you'd actually recognize him because he has an unusual figure. So he looks like a humanoid kind of, but he's got orange skin that's quite bumpy and things. And he wears a special type of mask. So the mask actually goes over his eyes and his mouth because he needs to breathe air through a filter because of the planet Dorin, but also the liquid in his eyes would evaporate if he took the mask off. Plo Koon is also known as one of the best pilots in the Jedi Order. Even Anakin Skywalker has been known to compliment him. He also had a Padawan called a Boltar Swan, and they became a Jedi Knight and actually fought in the Battle of Geonosis and seemingly survived. You can see them very, very briefly. In addition to that, Plo Koon actually has a blue lightsaber. However, in the late 90s, early 2000s, before he was in the Clone Wars series and things like that, he was actually shown having an orange lightsaber. And when I was doing research, I was like, wait a minute, does he have an orange or blue? Because for some reason in my mind, I remember him having an orange lightsaber. So that's just a fun little thing. And then last of all, Plo Koon is very famously known in the Clone Wars from Season 1, Episode 2, where the clones say, just leave us, General. We're just clones. We're expendable. And Plo Koon says, not to me and then saves them. And it's just a very iconic line, and it really sets up how the Clone Wars is going to go, and really the the brilliance that Dave Filoni and George Lucas did of making clones, who are literally clones of Jango Fett, have their own individual personality, and you really do care about them. And that's one of the great things about the Clone Wars. And just to add in here, if you are a Jedi Padawan in the Clone Wars, you get called a Commander, and if you are a Jedi Knight, you are called a General. And that's how they kind of converted the Jedi Order into warfare. But with that in mind, let's delve back into the story. So this is issue number one's kind of main story. So the story is a flashback on the planet called Benglor, which I couldn't find elsewhere. And you've got Anakin, Rex, and a bunch of clones walking through a very, very hot climate. They're absolutely sweating. The clones have taken their helmets off. And Anakin's like, we need to find a place to stop because I can't deal with this. 
but they then find a few droid pieces, so pieces of a B1 battle droid that's kind of been thrown together and strewn about. They can't really figure out what it is, and they start to kind of look around and things, and then one of the clones, a gentleman named Bello, follows things, and then a couple of eyes show behind him, and then he gets eaten by this giant frog monster thing. It reminds me a little bit of, was it Ogdo Bogdo in the Jedi Fallen Order game, but I couldn't find any clarification of the same thing, and I think Ogdo Bogdo has like loads of eyes and stuff, but it's similar to that if you've played those games. But yeah, this poor clone Bello gets eaten. Anakin then tells the rest of the clones to fall back, but a clone trooper called Hardcase goes back after the beast, trying to save his brother. Anakin does manage to save Hardcase from this beast, and then it really stands firm and says, look, you clones need to retreat. You are in danger. Anakin then fights this beast, seemingly trying to not use lethal blows, throws like a tree on it, but it keeps just getting up. Rex then shows up to support Anakin, and Anakin's like, you don't need to be here, you need to retreat, and he's like, well, I got my clones to retreat, but I'm here to support you, General. They manage to knock out the beast, and then Anakin says that clones are not only soldiers, that they are men, and he will protect their lives on his missions. And Rex is hugely appreciative of this, and Hardcase got away okay, and so did the rest of the clones. So now back to the framing story. Hardcase is there along with Rex and Cody and things, and they receive a communication from Plo Koon. But they can't really hear it clearly, there's some sort of interference going on. So the clones decide they need to go and talk to Wolf to try and find out what this is saying and try and decipher it, especially because the communication came from Plo Koon, and Plo Koon's second in command is Commander Wolf. And then they see in the background of Plo Koon's transmission, Anakin and Dooku are about to fight. And that is where this issue ends. So I want to note here Hardcase. We don't actually know Hardcase's ID number and things, but he is in the Umbaran slash Krell arc. That is in season four. It's one of the darkest story arcs of the Clone Wars. It's got some of the darkest stuff in Star Wars period in it and is one of the best stories told, not just in the Clone Wars, but in the whole of Star Wars. So I'm not going to say anything else about that here, but if you know that Umbaran arc, you know exactly what I'm talking about with Pong Krell, but uh, we will get there in our Clone Wars Conversations Watch, which will be coming out across 2024 on the feed of Comics in Motion and on the YouTube channel of Genuine Chit Chat. So make sure you subscribe to both of those. And then every month, myself, Dave and Math are going to be going through episodes of the Clone Wars and reviewing them and talking about them. Math has never seen them before, but similar to our Star Wars Rebels review that we did this year in 2023, we're going to do that with Clone Wars Conversations. We're going to do one season per month and some of the more intense seasons like season four, we're going to split in two. But I'll give you more information on that towards the end. So back to the comics, we move on to issue number two. The artist for the story in that is Megan Levins and the colour artist is Charlie Kirchhoff. So issue two starts with the framing story where you've got Obi-Wan and Anakin fighting Count Dooku and Asajj Ventress. Plo Koon is communicating to the clones via Hollow, saying that they're all tied up, but they need the clones to go and get the parliamentary members, aka the hostages, and Plo Koon will send the coordinates. Commander Wolf is Plo Koon's second in charge, so Rex and Cody go and ask Wolf what to do, as in, would the general, aka Plo Koon, trust the clones to go off and do their own mission and make their own decisions while doing it? And Wolf says that the general would trust clones to fulfil their mission, and then we get a flashback to evidence that. Now, I just wanted to quickly note here, in case you haven't heard of Asajj Ventress, she's a very interesting character. She's one of my favourite characters in animation. She is a Dathomirian Night Sister. She comes from the same planet as Darth Maul. And in fact, the clans are quite interconnected. But if you want to find out all about that, you need to watch quite a bit of the Clone Wars. But Asajj Ventress in canon was shown, granted, in the Clone Wars movie. That's where we first kind of saw her. But chronologically speaking, she first appears in the Brotherhood book by Mike Chen. That's when Anakin and Obi-Wan first come into contact with her. And obviously Count Dooku, if you want a lot of information on Count Dooku, check out Kevin Scott's audio drama, Dooku Jedi Lost, all the episodes of Tales of the Jedi, which are really, really interesting, or you can go back to one of my very earlier episodes, I think it's within the first sort of 20 episodes, where I did a whole bio episode on Count Dooku and spoke about a lot of the information about him that we got from comics and the Clone Wars and things like that. So I'd recommend go back, listen to that episode, and then watch Tales of the Jedi, and then you have a good understanding of what Count Dooku was up to. But back to the story. So we delve into this flashback. So we've got Plo Koon and the Wolf Pack, which is what he names his group of clones led by Commander Wolf. So they're on a mission to attack something called the Nexus, which is this floating outpost somewhere. Plo Koon notes that he will attack in the air with a group of fighters, while the Wolf Pack will attack as clones on foot. They're going to fly an LAAT nearby to it, and the clones are going to get off and attack. So Amir Tambor has got hostages there, hence why they need to be quite careful with how they approach this. So Plo Koon and the others will cause a distraction in the air, or the wolf pack fly their LAAT nearby, and then use jetpacks to get from the LAAT to the Nexus, and then try and take it. Turrets start to fire on them, and Tambor releases some special droids that can fly. 
So a few things to delve into here. So first of all, Emir Tambor seems to be some sort of relation to Wat Tambor. Wat Tambor was one of the leaders of the Confederacy of Independent Star Systems, aka the Separatists. You do see him in Attack of the Clones, and he's the guy who, when Obi-Wan is spying on Count Dooku talking to people, he is talking and his voice goes all weird like a modulator thing, and he's talking and he twists a dial and then he speaks. That's Wat Tambor. That's the way I always remember him. And he does also get killed by Anakin on Mustafar in Revenge of the Sith. But Amir Tambor seems to be some sort of relative to him. I can't see any other reference to Amir, so he's just some random Tambor, I suppose, but he's somewhere high up in the family. Then LAATs are called Low Altitude Assault Transport. You saw them first in Attack of the Clones because it delivered a lot of the clones to Geonosis and things. And then they're all across the Clone Wars, and then you see quite a few of them in Revenge of the Sith as well. And last of all, these special droids that can fly. So they're called D1 Series Aerial Battle Droids. They are essentially B1 battle droids, the ones with the long noses, but they've got wings, essentially. We saw them in Season 7 of The Clone Wars, so right near the very end, and they're only in like a few episodes. I think they're in the episodes with the Bad Batch and stuff, but yeah, they can fly. So back to the story. Wolf tags one of these droids with a detonator, throws it into the Nexus bridge, and it explodes. It damages a lot of the equipment, and it smokes out Tambor and the rest of the people inside. The hostages seem to be fine, though, but the Nexus security systems are now offline but Tambor would rather destroy the whole outpost as opposed to surrendering it. Tambor manages to flee by the winged droids grab him and essentially fly away, and then the hostages are left with the clones on an exploding outpost. The Nexus starts to fall, the clones trying to use their jetpacks to save the hostages and themselves, and then Plo Koon flies in on a ship to save them all, including the hostages, from the blast radius. The clones then apologise to Plo Koon for failing to obtain the outpost, but Plo Koon says that the mission was a success because all of the clones are alive and they saved the hostages and that was the most important part. So that ends the flashback and we go back to the framing story where the group of clones are near the coordinates they were given by Plo Koon and see some droids holding the parliamentary hostages so they try to plan the next course of action. So we move on to issue number three and the artwork, including all of the colour art, was all done by Valentina Pinto for the flashback story. So let's delve straight in and we're in the framing story again, where Cody and the clones find those prisoners and they manage to take out the droids with an EMP blast. In essence, EMPs, they're like thermal detonators, but instead of it throwing and exploding, it shoots out an electromagnetic pulse and it short circuits any droids nearby. It's very common during the Clone Wars and there's one specific episode where Anakin Skywalker trains Saul Gorera and her sister and things to fight against some droids and he shows them how to use these in quite a lot of detail. So the flashback is to Obi-Wan Kenobi along with Commander Cody and Padme Amidala, and they are discussing a mission where some clone troopers have gone missing on a world with an uneasy allegiance to the Republic. And to investigate this, they will need to use incredible subtlety. So it's confirmed here that Padme got the intel for this whole situation from a friend on the world of Crystar. Padme's friend is an Ovisian, as is the Regent, and the Regent himself is quite rude. While this is all going on, Waxer and Boyle, two clones, sneak off the ship with some others and search for the imprisoned brothers on the world. So a little bit of information here. So Avisians, they are a species that were introduced in the Rise of Skywalker. Right near the start, you have a character called Bulio, and he unfortunately gets his head cut off and thrown on the First Order table by Kylo Ren when he's speaking to like the First Order Council. Now, Avisians are somewhat humanoid-ish. They're kind of a bit more hulking. They've got two head tusks coming out the side of their heads. I don't believe they have noses. And because they were first in The Rise of Skywalker, they haven't actually been that common in the canon. However, there was one in the Battle of Jeddah and Path of Vengeance books in the High Republic Phase 2. That is an Avisian called Bokana Kos. And he was quite a nice character. Now, to Waxa and Boyle the clones. So, Boyle has got a handlebar moustache and is in seasons 1, 2, and 4 of The Clone Wars, and he's also in the Dark Disciple novel, which was made from unused Clone Wars arcs regarding Asajj Ventress and Quinlan Voss, which I hugely recommend, and I believe I have done a book review for that, so check that out if you fancy it. Another fun fact about Boyle is a Twi'lek called Numa on Ryloth has got his name written on her armour on her left arm, and it's written in Arabesh, and you can see it in Star Wars Rebels. So because Boyle was in Season 1 of the Clone Wars, I believe he was in the Ryloth arc, and you saw Numa when she was very young, and then you see her grown up in Star Wars Rebels, and obviously Boyle and the clones really helped with the liberation of Ryloth, or at least the attempted liberation of Ryloth, because that's always like a back and forth kind of place. But I'm not going to delve into the history of Ryloth here, but check out the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels to find out more, as well as the Lords of the Sith book. Now the clone Waxer is also in Season 1 of the Clone Wars, he is in the Ryloth arc, and he is also in the Umbaran arc and he is a part of the 212th Attack Battalion. 
So back to the story, Waxer and Boyle manage to find their imprisoned brothers that are guarded by droids. They tell Obi-Wan, who then tells Padme, and she overhears that the Regent is selling the clones to a Trandoshan who's going to hunt them for sport. Upon hearing this, Obi-Wan notes that they must now act because the Regent has gone too far and they will deal with the galactic repercussions after they've helped these clones. So the clones with Obi-Wan and Padme, they decide to cover themselves in mud to try and avoid some of the sensors, and they tell the imprisoned clones to prepare to attack. So they then hatch an escape plan, the clones do escape and defeat the droids and things, and then Obi-Wan saves Padme and her friend from a Trandoshan who is about to attack them, because the way Padme and her friend found out about the regent selling the clones to the Trandoshan is that Padme did her usual, she snuck around and then listened into a meeting that was seemingly private. So Obi-Wan saves them from this Trandoshan, the Regent is going to go into custody, and the clones thank Obi-Wan for saving their brothers and choosing their lives over the political fallout. And Obi-Wan says that they are all allies, and he will fight for them all in equal measure, be it Jedi, be it clones, be it senators, Obi-Wan will always fight for them. So that's the end of that flashback, so we go back to the framing story, where the clones are now escorting the parliamentary members out of the area, and then they hear Rex on the comms asking for help. So that's where issue 3 ends, so we delve into issue 4. So the artist for the flashback in issue 4 is David Tinto, and the colour artist is Thomas Deere. So we delve into issue 4, back into the framing story, where we've got Rex and the clones are fighting loads and loads of droids, and one of the clones is actually called Twitch. Now Twitch is quite scared and he wants to retreat, but then the clone called Heater tells him what it's like to run. And then the flashback starts. So the flashback starts on Kamino, which is the watery world that we see quite a lot in the Clone Wars. We obviously see it in Attack of the Clones. That's where we first saw it. It's one of my favorite parts of the prequels is Obi-Wan going around and investigating stuff. I think it's very, very cool. And then also in the Bad Batch, we get a lot more about Kamino as well, which is really, really interesting. It's one of my favorite parts of the Bad Batch series when they go back to Kamino. So check out the Bad Batch if you finish the Clone Wars. So in this flashback, there's a bunch of clones that call Heater, as well as some other clones, deserters and cowards. So they can get into a fist fight about that, and then a more senior clone, who's in armour, comes over, interjects, and then takes Heater away from this confrontation to have a talk. Now the senior clone in armour is actually Commander Wolf, and Commander Wolf notes that training says a lot about the clones, and essentially what happened is that in a training exercise, Heater and the other clones abandoned their brothers, and that's what's caused this whole conflict within the clone barracks. Eater notes that he's conflicted because he's unsure what he would do in a real life scenario where there is life or death between him and some other brothers. So Wolf says that he'll give him an opportunity. He'll go and give him a mission so he can clear his name along with his other brothers that have been called deserters. And then at the end of the mission, if it's a success, then the group of clones can then choose to be completely free of the Republic army or they can choose to continue in service. So to this, Eater does accept. So later we see the mission underway. Eater and his squad are in an LAAT and the mission is to stop a weapons depot delivering weapons to a planet that the Republic is trying to liberate from the Separatists. One of the clones there is called Racetrack, and he says this is a one-way mission. The ship then gets hit by something and crash lands, so obviously morale is not that high. The clones get out and start to explore, and then Heater notes that they need to stand together and work as one unit. Racetrack then decides to distract some of the droids with helmets filled with a detonator, while others sneak into this weapons depot. The clones manage to set some charges and things, but then are surrounded by droids. A tactical droid emerges and says that the clones acted completely predictably, and then as they're about to be executed, Racetrack then fires from somewhere above in like rafters, taking out a lot of the droids, including the tactical droids, and then the rest of the clones manage to escape, detonate the explosives, and so the weapons depot blows up. After the mission, Wolf then picks up these clones and then says, look, you can either go away and be fully free away from the Republic, or you can stay, what's your choice? and Heater and all of the clones unanimously say they want to stay in the clone army, so they head home to Kamino. Then we get the framing story again, and there are some explosions, there's a lot of smoke and dust, and again the artwork in all of these issues is actually really good, and we see that Cody, Wolf, and the rest of the clones show up to try and help out Rex, and although they are fighting off a lot of the droids, they still need help. So just wanted to note here, the flashback mission in this issue I really did quite enjoy because a lot of the things with clones is that they don't seemingly have a choice, and in this the clones were actually given a choice. They completed a mission and they could be let completely free. Now I'm unsure if the Republic would have actually allowed Wolf to give that kind of authority to let some clones just leave the army of the Republic, but it's still an interesting idea. And obviously the clones are genetically bred specifically to try and work together, to be okay soldiers, all those kinds of things. So it's quite interesting, and it's, it's really a part that 
The Clone Wars has tackled a little bit. There is the episode, or it might be like a two-part arc, which is the Deserter, which is a really interesting arc. And there's a lot of conversations that can be had, and I'm sure myself, Math and Dave will have these when we do Clone Wars conversations in 2024, about like the logistics of clones and the morality behind it, and you know, creating an army of people who's just clones of someone else, and whether or not they're actually expendable. Those are things that really do get spoken about a lot in the Clone Wars, and it's a very mature theme for essentially a kid's show. So uh, it's just something that I found really interesting, and I really liked the message they were trying to portray in this mission, in this issue. Uh, so I just want to say I really enjoyed that. So with that in mind, we move on to the final issue, issue number five. So the artist for the flashback in issue five is Philip Murphy, and the colour artist is Rebecca Nolte. So the framing story begins with the clones, Rex, Cody, and Wolf, and etc. They are alive, but a big explosion really didn't help them. They are completely surrounded by droids, and then Cody mentions that getting captured is not always the worst thing. And so with that, we move into the final flashback mission of this collection of stories. And this flashback features Obi-Wan Kenobi, Commander Cody, and Gear Shift, as well as other clones who have been captured by General Grievous and some droids and are being told they need to build a lunar ice bridge. Obi-Wan says no to this, so Grievous smacks him onto the floor. So Gear Shift is actually a clone that's in the Clone War series. He is in Season 2, Episode 7, and the name of the episode is Legacy of Terror, and it is the second battle of Geonosis. Now, I'm not going to give Grievous's full biography here because only a couple episodes ago in episode 139, which was the second half of the Yoda series, in that I give loads of information about Grievous and stuff. So uh, check out that episode and then also watch The Clone Wars and that's where you get pretty much all the information about Grievous in the canon. So back to the story, where Obi-Wan doesn't have his lightsaber and the clones have all had their weapons taken away, they don't really have any choice, so they just do what Grievous says. So they start building this lunar ice bridge, but Obi-Wan tells the clones to not build it very well so that they can get the Separatists. And then one of the natives, called a Quay, at least that's what they call them here, which I've not really seen elsewhere in the canon, they're kind of like Ewoks a little bit, this native Quay calls to them. Obi-Wan sees the Quay and sees that they are separated from their family. So Obi-Wan says to the clones, look, we need to build this bridge really, really strong, so that Quay can be reunited with his family. And we need to make it even stronger than it was before Grievous destroyed it during the planet's invasion. It's clear that the Quay want to fight Grievous as well. So Obi-Wan and the clones are rebuilding the bridge and the Quay crawl over Grievous, like hugging him it seems. And while Grievous is trying to like swat them off, the Quay managed to subtly grab Obi-Wan his lightsaber back. Then once the bridge is built, Grievous predictably turns onto Obi-Wan and the clones and plans on killing them. Obi-Wan says he knew this was coming, and so the Quay attack. That gives enough of a distraction for Obi-Wan to ignite his lightsaber and go at Grievous. So Grievous and Obi-Wan clash lightsabers while the clones are taking out the droids. The clones manage to get to their ship, and Obi-Wan manages to get Grievous into a position and then causes an avalanche to bury him and the remaining droids. The ship collects Obi-Wan. He notes that the Quays are now all safe and the entire family are together on the other side of the bridge. So Obi-Wan and the clones blow up the bridge so the Quays are left safe and they've undone the work that Grievous forced them to do, and they all escape. And that is the end of that flashback. So now we start to wrap up with the final part of this framing story. The droids take aim at Rex, Cody, Wolf, and the remaining clones, and then Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Plo Koon show up and destroy all of the droids, and saving all of the clones. Plo Koon congratulates the clones, and then they are called back to Coruscant by Yoda for another mission. And that, my friends, is where this episode ends. So this was a really fun episode to do. I was a little bit hesitant, and obviously I've been talking about doing the Clone Wars Battle Tales for ages. I wasn't sure how good it was going to be, but it really does feel like this was used from almost scripts that were not in the Clone Wars. Like, this didn't feel inorganic, it didn't feel like it was jarring at all. And I feel like if this was made into an episode, it would actually do a really good job of introducing the Clone Wars. You know, I have my issues with the Clone Wars movie, which we'll get into in an episode I should be releasing in December, where myself, Megan, Math, and Dave are all going to be watching that as the kind of final episode as the predecessor to the Clone Wars conversations. But yeah, I really enjoyed this. It feels like a really good introduction to the Clone Wars, to what the clones are like, and to some of the relationships that the clones have with their respective generals, who obviously are the Jedi. I must say that I'm getting a little bit sick of framing stories and flashbacks. I know it's quite a common thing in the All Ages comics. I know Kevin Scott does it a lot in his horror anthologies, which for those it makes sense, but I feel like for a lot of these other ones, I don't really like the format because you kind of don't get one full story. You get five or six really small stories. And although they're fun and some of the stories are better than others, I'm not the biggest fan of anthologies. I often find that the stories aren't flushed out enough. I find that when you get one that's really good, it's just over too quickly. And I always find the framing stories are usually pretty weak. Like even in the comics I've enjoyed, like the Tales from Vader's Castle and those sort of things, the framing stories are just, they're excuses to tell stories. And I understand why they are that, but I don't know why it has to be that way. I suspect maybe because where Star Wars is like a canon where like 
all of the stories have to interconnect in some way. It's quite hard to be like, here's just a story that's all horror-y. Here's a story where this thing happens without giving some degree of context. And I think the only way you can really give it context is by a character in-universe explaining it. So I guess that's kind of how they get around it. But for me, it's just not that enjoyable in the same way. I'd rather just have a story and not have like a few pages of almost fluff at the start and the end of them. But I feel like because these are all ages comics, maybe for younger readers, it's much more grabbing it makes a lot more sense to them narratively if you have a framing story and clear flashbacks and things like that and i feel like in kids films they do it a little bit where they've got a main story and then the main story gets interrupted by people who are telling the story and asking questions i know book of life is like that so um maybe that's why it is but it was fun it's it's not like a must read but i think that if you're a fan of the clone wars this is actually quite a fun read it's not too tasking the artwork's really cool and there are some fun stories in there and obviously seeing some familiar clones is really cool too So what have we got going on? Well, my friends, only yesterday I recorded an interview with Ethan Sachs. So Ethan is an author. I mean, he was a journalist and he's now become an author. He's written like an indie miniseries called A Haunted Girl. He's done a lot of other indie comics as well. But you'd probably know him and recognize his name from the Bounty Hunters ongoing series that is wrapping up with, I think, the 40th issue this year. He also wrote the Galaxy's Edge anthology, which I tackled on the show, Star Wars Allegiance miniseries, which I tackled on the show, and the Helysion Legacy as well. Obviously, I tackled on the show because I've tackled every canon Marvel Star Wars comic up to a certain date. But I had a fantastic time talking to Ethan. He was very generous with his time. I spoke to him for a little over an hour, and it was just a fantastic conversation if you're a Star Wars fan, which if you're listening to this, I assume you are. So uh, look out for that. It should be out like the day after this releases. So it will be on the feed of Genuine Chit Chat. It's on Genuine Chit Chat's YouTube channel. And I'll put it on the feed of Star Wars Comics in Canon as well. So please check that out and share where you can online. And make sure you tag Ethan as well and tell him how much you enjoyed the conversation. I also do have another conversation due for recording in the next couple of weeks with another Star Wars content creator. But I don't want to delve into that until I've got that recording in the bag. Speaking of Star Wars conversations, if you haven't listened to prior episodes of Star Wars Comics in Canon or any of my interview episodes, please go back and check those out. I've interviewed Kevin Scott, Claudia Gray, Kevin Shinnick, and George Mann. So those are all really cool conversations. They're on playlists on YouTube in my Star Wars Conversations playlist, or you can just type in their name into a podcast app and it should come up. So in addition to that, what's going on in my world? So I recently have done a couple of guest spots. So myself and Megum on Spider Dan and the Secret Boars. We did a Day of the Dead special Clone Boars episode. So we compared Coco and the Book of Life. So make sure you check that out. A link is in the description. I was also on Back to the Filmography recently, where I spoke with Jack about Nomeo and Juliet. So that was quite a fun one. I've also got some great interviews coming up on Genuine Chit Chat. Obviously, I mentioned the Ethan Sachs one. There's another Star Wars author that will be further down the road. And then there's a couple of other cool ones in between as well. So make sure you check that out. Make sure you subscribe to youtube.com slash Genuine Chit Chat. If you're already there, please like, please subscribe and do all that amazing stuff. Leave comments. Tell me what you thought about this episode. If you're listening on a standard podcast app, please share. Please leave reviews as well. If you can leave a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, any of those places, send a screenshot of it to me and I'll send you some extra bonus content that you can't find anywhere else that I put on my Patreon. Speaking of my Patreon, go to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat and for as little as £1 a month you get access to over 190 episodes of Afterthought. That's where myself and usually Megan release episode reviews on a lot of stuff. We've done TV shows, we've done movies, we've been in spooky season recently so we've done all the Nightmare on Elm Street films, we've also done a couple of others, we've recorded a review for Rosemary's Baby recently, for Scream 6 and some other cool stuff too. And then as we get nearer December I have agreed with Megan that we're going to watch a bunch of Christmas movies including some cheesy Hallmark Christmas movies. So our reviews are only normally like 10 to 20 minutes long, they're quite easy and bite-sized but they're a lot of fun and I love doing them with Megan and everyone who's been listening to them has had a great time. So thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you to anyone who considers subscribing to me on Patreon. If you can't contribute financially, as I said, just leave a review, send me a screenshot of it either via email at genuinechitschat at outlook.com or send to me on social media and I'll send you a free episode of Afterthoughts. If you want to contribute financially, but you don't want to commit to a monthly payment, you can go to coffeeko-fi.com slash genuine chits chat. You can give a one-off donation. And if you do that, I'll send you a few episodes of Afterthoughts as well. The more you donate, the more you'll get. And when you raise the payment, you can put a little comment in there. And if you just say anything that you'd fancy hearing, like some spooky stuff or road trips with me and Megan or anything like that, then I can adhere to your request. If you don't want to contribute financially and you've already reviewed the show or you don't want to review the show for any reason at all, then you can still support the show in a number of other ways. Obviously, you're listening now, which is a great way to do it. You can also share on social media and tell your friends about it. If you're listening to this and you love Star Wars, I'm sure you know at least one other person who enjoys Star Wars. Please send this show to them. Send one of the episodes of one of their favorite characters. So if you can share this with other people, it would mean the world to me. I think aside from that, friends, we are done. So just make sure you follow me on social media at Genuine Chit Chat on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and X slash Twitter. 
Subscribe to youtube.com slash genuine chit chat. I'm trying to get my subscribers up as well. And just thank you as always for being awesome. So what have we got coming up next week? Um, it's going to be another ongoing series. I'm trying to do alternate weeks of mini series and ongoing series. So I've done the Star Wars 2020 run up to the Dark Toys crossover event. So the next ones I'm going to do is the Darth Vader comics. So these are 2020 run by Greg Pak. I've tackled all the other Darth Vader comics as well. I've tackled all the other Darth Vader comics up to this point, apart from Black, White and Red, which I will be releasing a separate episode on at some point in the future. So make sure you look out for that. And one of the in-between episodes I'll be doing that's not the Darth Vader ongoing series is going to be Life Day. So there's the Life Day comic one shot that I tackled last year, which was great fun. It was, it was written by Kevin Scott and a variety of other authors. So that was really good fun. And then there's the Life Day Treasury, which is by, I believe, Kevin Scott and George Mann. It's a bunch of short stories. There's a little bit of artwork in there. So I'm going to tackle that. There's some High Republic connections. There's some other cool stuff too. So I'm going to read that and release that in between. And I should be releasing that right near Thanksgiving. I think Thanksgiving is in the week. And obviously these episodes drop on Saturdays. So it's either going to be a little bit before Thanksgiving or a little bit after Thanksgiving. So that'll be the Life Day Treasury. But that's what we've got coming up over the next few weeks. So it's a lot of cool stuff before the High Republic fully kicks off again. But fear not, once that all happens, I will be delving in. But uh, you know, just subscribe wherever you are listening to this and you will not miss a thing. But friends, thank you as always for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you, especially listening all the way up to the very end. I will talk to you next week. And of course, may the Force be with you. The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit-chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.